special service and so broke up the completion of our uh, study of Ephesians. This week we are going to conclude that. One thing I do want to note, however, is uh, I am going to be gone uh, Tuesday through Thursday. I'm going to Grand Rapids this week for the pastor's conference or leadership conference up there of the Grace Gospel Fellowship. So I will have my cell phone with me. If you need to get in contact with me, don't hesitate to give me a call, but I won't be able to come directly if you need anything. Uh, so just so that you're aware, I will be back though Thursday afternoon. So if you look in your bulletins, each of you should have a summary sheet like this. And so before we get into looking at these final passages in Ephesians that were read earlier, I do want us to review some of these important, the most important uh, truths that were brought out in this very, very significant, very important letter of the Apostle Paul. Uh, of course, it began with an introduction where Paul introduced who he was, identified who he was, and then offered uh, blessings of grace and peace to them. He identified himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ, a, a prisoner of the Lord. Then he went into, in verses 3 to 6 of chapter 1, in which he identified the fact that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings, that uh, by virtue of being members of the body of Christ, by virtue of our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God has just poured out on us these blessings of, of eternal life, of sanctification, of uh, security in Christ, uh, of, of the power of the Holy Spirit. There's the, the blessings, the list goes on and on and on of all the things that we have simply by being a member of the body of Christ. These are blessings that we have. We don't work for them. We don't have to earn them. They have been given to us by God's grace. That we were chosen in Christ uh, to be holy and to be blameless, adopted, of ch uh, adopted children of God. That's another... Uh, fact of who we are. It's our identity that we are the children of God by virtue of what Christ has done for us. Goes on to, to emphasize the idea that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That when Christ died on the cross, shed his blood for our sins, that we, that we, were, we were forgiven. All of the sins, all of the things that we had done that disobeyed God, all that we had, had done and will do that is opposed to his will is wiped out, is forgotten, is, is forgiven. And we are redeemed, we are bought back through his blood. Verses 13 through 14, very important passages of scripture. Uh, I, in fact, if you, have, uh, if you have a pen, you might want to put a star by this one because this emphasizes our security in Christ. The idea that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise and deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Next to salvation itself, the fact that we are saved by grace through faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next to the doctrine of salvation itself, I don't believe there is any other biblical teaching more important than that of eternal security. And that is emphasized here in these verses about the fact that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Not until the next time we sin or the next time we make some mistake or if we have doubts. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, a guarantee, a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. I tell you, if I, if I did not have certainty of my security in Christ, I would be living day to day in fear. I, the Christian life wouldn't be joy. It would be one of fear. It would be one of, uh, of worrying if I'm being good enough, if, I, if I'm keeping up, uh, maintaining whatever it is that I have to maintain, and if I'm doing the right things, if I have the right set of rules, because maybe I have the wrong set of rules, and then, I, then it's all null and void. I tell you, this idea of being sealed with the Holy Spirit is absolutely vital if we really, truly want to be able to experience the joy of our salvation. So as I said, you might want to put a little note there, a little star by those verses, because they are so important. He ends the chapter, or the chapter ends, I should say, because he didn't make the chapter divisions, but the chapter ends with a prayer in which he is praying and asking that God would give understanding and wisdom to the believers. Then in chapter 2, he is emphasizing some of these ideas again, emphasizing the fact that we were dead in our sins 
but we've been made alive in Christ. That all, all human, all of mankind was separated from God, dead in sin, had no hope outside of Christ. But then, through the work of Christ, when we put our faith in him, we've been made alive. And that we've been seated with Christ. This is part of our position. Once again, not something that we do. This is what God does uh, for us. He sees us next to the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ interceding on our behalf. Verses 18, 11 through 18 emphasize the idea that we were alienated and foreigners. Now he's talking about the, the division between Jews and Gentiles. Separated. The Gentiles did not have a knowledge of God. They were, they were separated from him. But that barrier has been broken down through the cross of Jesus Christ and the two have been made one. He's going to talk more about that, give a more full explanation of what he's talking about there in the next chapter. Uh, and that uh, the chapter once again ends em emphasizing the idea that Jews and Gentiles are being built together into the temple of God. That leads into what we read in chapter 3 in the summary, uh, where he points out the fact that the, the church today and the, the dispensation that God is working in today is, was a previously unrevealed secret. Nothing in the Old Testament talks about this. He refers to what, uh, what is called the unsearchable riches of God, the unseekable, unfathomable, uh, the riches of God that, that cannot be traced out. And we pointed out that that word unsearchable comes from the idea of, of, of uh, an animal trail, that a hunter would follow a trail. You can follow it forward, you can follow it back to the source. But in this case, it doesn't go back. There's nothing to trace backward. It's, it's untraceable. The untraceable, unsearchable riches of God, which is this dispensation of grace. It was a previously unrevealed secret nowhere in the Old Testament in all of the prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, about the hope for Israel, about, uh, about um, the work that Christ was going to do that is, that is in the Old Testament. Nothing is revealed about the fact that Jews and Gentiles were going to be one body uh, in Christ. And then verses 6 and 7 emphasize the idea that the secret, the, the mystery, uh, most translations use the word mystery, but a better word for that is simply a secret. The secret that God was keeping to himself that was revealed through the Apostle Paul is that Jews and Gentiles are now equal members of the body of Christ. That we don't have to follow the Jewish laws. We don't have to go through all of those things. We don't have to be circumcised and, and then uh, follow the dietary laws and all of the things that were necessary for the Jews. That now God in Christ has brought us all together. We are one humanity saved by grace through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 20, 14 through 21 is another prayer. And in this case, he's specifically praying, asking that, that people would understand these distinctive differences. And I'll tell you, that is a prayer that, is, that needs still to be prayed to this day because so much of the church fails to really recognize that distinction. I was sharing with some people this week... Um, uh, last week, I, I went to another church that had a Saturday evening service. I just wanted to kind of be refreshed myself before Sunday morning. And I, I tell you, I came away from that service believing, if I believed what this pastor was telling me, I myself am not going to heaven. I, I, he was essentially telling me, if I have not been water baptized, you're not going to heaven. And that did not that didn't give me peace at all. Well, it didn't bother me really because I, you know, I understood that he was not correct. Um, it didn't it didn't have the intended purpose of of helping me worship. I'll say that. But it was it, it was um, it was it, this prayer that that Paul was asking two thousand years ago still needs to be prayed today. He's, he was asking that they would understand the distinction, the differences here that he, is, he was presenting to them so that people could have that assurance, that absolute total assurance of, of eternal life. And, uh, and, and we still need to be asking God to provide that insight to, to the church today so that people can have, just have a sense of, of, of certainty. Um, if Otherwise, you're just left with, with confusion and you're left worried. Ephesians chapter 4 is a major shift now. Uh, starting in verse 1, now he's beginning to talk. He uses this word frequently, walk 
or live your life in a certain way, that your life should now reflect the realities all these positional truths that he talks about in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, of being seated with Christ, of being an adopted child of Christ, all of the, these things, the, all of the blessings that are yours, having redemption through the forgiveness of sins, etc., etc., etc. All this foundation that he's built now, he's saying this is now to be translated into real-life actions. And he begins now by, by explaining, first of all, the fact that we are one in Christ. So he's, in, in chapter 3, he gave this very clear explanation of the fact that Jews and Gentiles are now part of one body. No longer is there a division, a separation between them. Now, if we are one body, that means we are unified, and that unity should be reflected in the way we live our lives. And so as there's this explanation and prayer for unity or, or, or uh, teaching about unity. He, he emphasizes the fact that there is a unity of the spirit. It is a reality that we with all other believers, all, all throughout the world and all throughout time that have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ are part of this single body of Christ. We are one unified together. And that, that's a truth. I've, I've, I've pointed it out a few times. Uh, the idea that as, as, you've had, as I've had opportunity to travel throughout the world uh, as a missionary and, and just in other opportunities of travel, it is something that you realize immediately when you come across another believer in Christ. There is an immediate connection there. And that's because of that unity that we have. And yes, we have differences. We have, we, we, as I was pointing out, there, there are still doctrinal disputes that go on throughout the, the church, the body of Christ. But ultimately, when push comes to shove, we are all one in Christ. If we believe that Christ died for our sins, we have that, that, that special unity. And so he points, there's seven points that he ma makes here, a sevenfold unity, one body, the body of Christ, one spirit, the Holy Spirit, one hope, that of course is looking and anticipating the rapture, being caught up together with him, one Lord, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, one faith, that is one truth and faith in the gospel, one baptism, it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that places us into the body of Christ, it's a spiritual act that places us into this, this unified single work of God which is called the body of Christ, one God and Father of all. And then in verses 7 through 16 of chapter 4, he points out the fact that God has given gifts, leadership gifts, pastors, apostles, teachers, for the purpose, um, uh, evangelists, for the purpose of, of building that unity in reality, making the, the th something that, that exists that, that is a spiritual reality to see it realized on earth, in the church itself. And he has given us these gifted individuals to teach and to preach and to guide and to lead the congregations so that, so that what is a, a positional reality can be a real thing on earth as we seek to grow and mature in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4 continues in which he set, gives us some instructions about our lifestyle. Don't walk like the Gentiles do. And he lists a number of, of uh, evil behaviors that were common and typical of the Gentiles. But put on this new man. Put on this, this new individual. And then do not grieve the spirit. Do not grieve the spirit through your lifestyle, through your attitudes, through your actions, through... Uh, through failing to, to recognize this, this truth of who we are in Christ. Do not give the Spirit sadness. Verse five, or chapter 5, then, uh, he continues on this theme of walking. He talks about walking in love. And he emphasizes that no evil should be named among the believers, that we should have a lifestyle that, that, that is glorifying to God. He tells us to walk in light. That we are no longer in the darkness, but now we are in the light of Christ, of, of the word of God, and, and of the reality of, of who Christ is. Walk in wisdom, be filled with the Spirit, singing and making melody in your heart. Uh, verses 21 to 33, now he talks about submission, submitting one to another. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And in chapter 6, then he continues on. Children, obey your parents. Fathers, train your children in the Lord. Servants, obey your masters, and masters, treat your servants as brothers. And then 
Two weeks ago, we started this study of the whole armor of God and emphasizing the idea that in our Christian life, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but it is spiritual in every nature, in every way. We are fighting a spiritual warfare against Satan and against his, his powers and his demons that are out to get us to... to uh, not that he can control us, we can't be possessed by the demons, but we certainly can be influenced by Satan and his schemes, trying to distract us from the, the glory of God. And so that takes us through this most important probably the pinnacle of, of Paul's letters in terms of emphasizing the grace of God. Uh, so Ephesians, uh, take some time, look through this, maybe just do a, a little bit of study on your own to remind yourself of these important truths. And so in the last sermon, two weeks ago, we began looking at this famous passage in Ephesians on the whole armor of God. We pointed out that the Greek uses just a single word, panoplia, to describe the whole armor. Whole armor is just a single word in the Greek. And so the idea there is that this is to be taken and put on as, as a complete set. That you don't just take one item. You know, today I'm going to go out with my, my shield, or today I'm going to go out with my breastplate, or today I'm going to wear the, the helmet, or you're going to leave any part of that behind. It is a single unit, the whole armor of God. You need all of it. You cannot leave yourself vulnerable in any way. Every part of the armor must be put on and used in order to stand against the schemes of Satan. We also noted that no, the different parts of the armor, how each one represents a different part of our spiritual defense against the attacks of Satan. There is truth, which is described as a belt, a belt which holds everything together, holds the armor in place, just as truth is a system that, that, that makes everything makes sense and everything has its place when it is within the confines of, of what, that which is true. Our hearts are protected by the breastplate of righteousness. Our feet are covered with the gospel of peace. And we were reminded that Isaiah uses the idea of the feet. Uh, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Of bring news good news is, of course, the gospel. Um, we have the shield of faith that protects us from the darts, the fiery darts and direct attacks of Satan. We pointed out that some of those fiery darts included temptation, envy, pride, doubt, complacency, discouragement, controversy, division. These are the kinds of things that Satan is trying to use to attack us on a day-to-day -day basis. And we need to have that, uh, that shield of faith that, that protects us, that keeps those things from being able to penetrate into our hearts. And then finally, the last piece of protective armor mentioned in this section is salvation. And it's described as a helmet. The helmet, of course, protects the head the most essential part of the body, and also the most vulnerable. And so this idea of salvation being that protection that, that keeps us alive, so to speak, keeps us from, from being, uh, being vulnerable to Satan's, uh, to, to losing our eternal destiny. Salvation is described as the, head, as the head. One commentator also mentioned the fact that the helmet was also symbolic of rank and status. And therefore, salvation, when it is worn with honor, represents what Christ has done for us. That we are children of God, and that helmet of salvation is representative of, and representative of that. And then he goes on, completing this list of the, the whole armor of God, describing the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, it's been pointed out that all the other parts of the armor are strictly defensive. The sword, however, is both defensive and offensive. You know, if you've ever watched anyone, you know, fencing or seen sword fights in movies and that kind of thing, you see that the sword is, can be used to attack with. That's what we normally think of it. But it's also used to protect from the other a sword that's coming at you and you deflect and you are able to put it off. And so the sword s serves as both a defensive and an offensive weapon uh, used uh, in our battle against Satan. An example of the word of God being used in a defensive manner 
is when Satan three times tried to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ to act outside of the will of God. Matthew chapter 4 describes how Satan tried to get Jesus, first of all, to turn stones into bread, using his, his power over nature, using the Lord's power over nature to bypass this necessary time of tempting. And so Satan said, you know, if you're, if you're who you claim to be, you can just take the, these, these rocks and you can turn them to bread. Because the Lord Jesus was out in the, the wilderness for 40 days. He was hungry. And Satan was saying, just turn these to bread. And of course, the Lord answered in, with the word of God. He used it in this defensive manner to say, but um, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He was emphasizing that his real strength his real strength was coming through the spiritual nourishment that he received from, from God himself. Then he also, Satan also went ahead and tried to get the Lord to throw himself off the highest point of the temple, forcing God the Father to send angels to the rescue. Then Jesus once again used the word of God in a defensive way to, to, uh, to try to resist that temptation in which he said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. That, that don't do things just to make God do something for you. Don't test him. That God is going to provide. God is going to do things, but they will, he will do them not because you're provoking those things, but because he is watching over you and protecting you according to his will. And then finally, Satan offered to let Jesus forego the need for suffering and immediately he could rule the nation. Satan said that he had authority over all the nations and that he could give them to him if only Jesus would bow down to him. And of course, Jesus once again answered from the word of God, all of this, by the way, from the, the book of Deuteronomy, uh, in which he said that you are to worship the Lord your God only, love the Lord your God and him alone. And so in each one of these cases, the Lord Jesus was familiar with the Old Testament scriptures and what God had said so that he was prepared in every instance to be able to respond appropriately. And so he was able, he, he was a master in a sense of being able to use the word of God in that defensive way. And this is a skill that many believers are losing because we become less and less familiar with the word, the sword of sword, which is the word of God, with the Bible. And we are less biblically illiterate, and as a result, we become more helpless to counter the lies of Satan and the world. I was listening to a, a show just this last week, actually, in which they were talking about how young people, the millennials, were leaving the church. That's, of course, a discussion you hear an awful lot about, is, is how the younger generation seems in mass to be stopping, you know, failing to go to church anymore or being involved or identifying with any, uh, with any church or organized church. And what this particular person found in his research is that one of the main reasons why young people are vulnerable and are not returning to the church is because of a lack of biblical literacy. They are biblically illiterate, which means that when they go off to college, and they are challenged by their professors uh, with different, these different ideas, they are unprepared to be able to answer those challenges, and therefore their faith then becomes vulnerable, they're undermined, and they become easy targets then for these secular influences to draw them away, and as a result then they fall back into the ways of the world. When someone questions the historical reliability of the Bible, or points out an apparent contradiction, or challenges the morality of the Bible, and offers the world's alternative as a standard of right and wrong, those who are unfamiliar with the scripture are unable to answer, and they cave in. And so this inability to use the word of God in a defensive way, because you simply don't know it, because you don't know what it contains, you don't know what the truth is, is, uh, is what is making the younger generation more vulnerable, and as a result, they're being drawn away and led away and, and going away from the church. Without being solidly grounded in God's will, our young people now are vulnerable to Satan's attacks. By the same token, God's word as the sword of the spirit, is an offensive weapon. 
It can be used and should be used to attack spiritual darkness. We need to use God's word in an offensive way that we take the initiative. Rather than being reactive to the world's lies, Christians should be aggressively proclaiming this truth even before the lies of the world are able to influence our young people and, and to reach their vulnerable hearts. This is why we teach the word of God to children at the youngest age and try to instill in them the truth of God before the world can corrupt them. Corrupt them. That is using the, the scriptures and using the word of God as an offensive weapon, first of all. Getting them before the world is able to corrupt them, before Satan is able to feed them those lies, we take the initiative through teaching the word of God. It is why we seek for opportunities to share the gospel with the lost. And why the truth is broadcast on radio and television, over the internet, and made available in every and every uh, media possible. We have the promise that the word of God will not return void. And that it will have an impact when it is proclaimed with conviction and boldness. And so we have the responsibility, the obligation to use the word in both an offensive and a defensive way. The author of Hebrews uses a similar picture of the power of the word of God in which he says that it is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's word as it is revealed in the scriptures is the most powerful offensive and defensive part of the entire armor. However, just like Anyone who handles any weapon, you must know how to use it. So that's another thing. You know, you, uh, I think one of the scariest things is to think about people that are out there with all kinds of weapons, whether it be knives or guns or anything, who don't have any idea how to use them. Uh, maybe some of you may have remembered, I don't know, about 10 years ago or something, there was, just as the internet was coming out, there was this viral video, one of the very first that came out of this young kid who was, uh, I don't think he ever realized that he was being filmed or didn't realize that the whole world was going to watch him. He was dressed up as, as Darth Vader or something like that and he had a, um, had a, a play sword, a lightsaber, and so and he was just kind of going all over the place and you watch it and you just couldn't ha help laughing. He was, just, he was just so wild and crazy in the way he was swinging it around. And so often that's the way that the word of God is mishandled today also. We're all familiar with these passages, this passage of scripture. Most of us know it in the King James, uh, where it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, the NIV has another way of rendering that, which I think is appropriate in this sense, in which it, it says, correctly handling the word of truth. And this is, of course, what uh, the, the point here. Every believer should know how to use the sword of the Spirit appropriately. Yet, unfortunately, many do not. There are many teachers and preachers that are out there. They're like the, like the kid with the lightsaber. And they're just going all over the place. And, and here, a little bit here and a little bit there and up and down and everything like that. And so what it leaves you is, yes, you've got that weapon. You've got the weapon in your hand, but you're using it inappropriately and it really is of no value. And of course, it begins with recognizing that God has revealed truth for the body of Christ, the church of this dispensation, through the Apostle Paul. And it is in his writings that we find the truth in order for us to live a confident and victorious Christian life today. When the person mixes law and grace, kingdom and the body of Christ, the program for Israel and Gentiles, it's like that person swinging the sword around or shooting a gun just in, you know, in any direction, just shooting off in the air. It's, they've got the weapon, they've got it in their hands, but it really is of no value to them because they don't know how to use it appropriately. And so that's what, what God is telling us to do here when he says us to rightly divide the word of truth or to handle that, the word of truth correctly. And then the passage goes on. It wraps up this discussion of the, uh, of the armor of God by telling us to be devoted in prayer. And this is probably the most important part of, the, of this entire section because by doing this he is emphasizing the fact 
that we need God's intervention for this even to be possible. For us to be able to put on the whole armor of God, we need God to be active in our lives and we need to be dependent on him. There is no other Christian activity that emphasizes our dependence on God than prayer. Because by praying, we are simply saying, Lord, I can't do this myself. I need your help. I need your guidance. I need your power. I don't have it. And he emphasizes the idea that it's done with, through, for supplication, which is making requests for all believers. That uh, we are told to turn everything over to God in prayers and supplication. And in this way, we acknowledge totally and completely our dependence on him. When we pray, we are asking for the Lord's intervention because we are saying we can't do it ourselves. And then likewise, Paul goes on in this passage and asks them, he says, and, and pray for me. He says, uh, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Uh, if you go back to Romans chapter 8, it talks about the need for praying in the Spirit. We don't know how to pray as we ought, and we need to depend on the Spirit's guidance and direction being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And then in verse 19, he says, And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And so Paul is saying that, that pray for me as well. He is asking for their prayers. He is asking, he reminds them that he was a prisoner, and he describes himself as an ambassador for Christ. And no doubt he was tempted. You know, you could just see him uh, even for as, as, as a powerful servant of God as the Apostle Paul was. He would have those moments. You know, here I am. I'm locked in this room. I have this guard here. I can't go out. Uh, I, you know, I'm just going to be quiet. I'm just going to, you know, I, I won't say anything. There's nobody to talk to. This guy has already heard it. What's the point? And he's saying, Give me the boldness to speak when I have the opportunity with, uh, with clarity and that I would open my mouth as I should. So imagine if Paul needed prayer about being bolder in sharing his faith, how much more do we? One of the most difficult parts of the Christian life is being able to share our faith boldly and to do it tactfully so that we are able to earn a hearing. This is a request that we, that we still can share. If the Apostle Paul had this, this request, we too need the same, the same types of prayers. Uh, and he, that we might be able to speak, as he says, as we ought to speak. And so praying, we can see this as an example of our need for prayer just as, as, as much as it was for him. If he, ha if he had to have people praying for him that he would speak boldly, how much more do we need those same kinds of prayers? And now as he's beginning to wrap this up, very interesting passage here, a reference that he makes to an individual. Now, as many of you know, something I like to point out, and usually it comes around this point in one of the letters, is I like to point out individuals who are just named in passing in the scriptures. Uh, I am especially fond of commenting on those whose names appear only once. And what is it, you know, imagine these people who have, own, they're, they're immortalized. I mean, we know these people because their name is in the Bible. And they have just this one reference to their name in this Bible. And what is the Bible saying about them? I, I think it's interesting to think about how Paul describes just ordinary people. They're immortalized because their names are there. And they're described in either positive or negative ways. Let's take a look at this guy here. Not yet Tychicus. We'll be getting to him in a minute. Uh, but there's this guy here named Philetus. And in this case, he's linked with a guy named Hymenaeus, who actually is mentioned in, in, in other places in the Bible. But Philetus, he only appears once. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and that they overthrow the faith of some. So you have this guy, Philetus. His name comes up one time in the Bible. And for the next 2,000 years, and who knows how much longer, people are going to read about him. And what is, you know, they say first impressions are the strongest. Well, what's the first impression you get about Philetus? 
Not good. <laughs> Not good. And everybody knows this guy. Everybody, well, everybody who studies the scripture, of course. Everybody who has studied the Bible, which is a lot of people over a long period of time, they have an opinion about Philetus. Then what is it? That he is like a cancer. That, he has, that he's full of profane and idle babblings. That he has led the faith of others astray. It's, uh, you know, you don't, wouldn't want that. You wouldn't want to be that person. You wouldn't want to be the person that was mentioned by the Apostle Paul as being full of idle and profane babblings or as, as leading people astray in their faith, as being like a cancer. But on the other hand, now let's take a look at this fellow Tychicus. Now he is mentioned actually five times in the scripture. And every one of them is either neutral and just describing who he is or is really quite positive. We'll look at the five different times that, that Tychicus is mentioned. We first find him just in, in passing as one of the companions of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, verse 4. And Sopatar of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Segundus of the, of the Thessalonians, Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. So we know that he was uh, at this point in Paul's uh, second and third missionary journey that they were accompanied by this group of people. One of them was Tychicus, who was from Asia, which is the area where this letter was being written. Colossae, Ephesus, um, that, that part of, uh, of uh, what is modern-day Turkey was the province, the Roman province, from which, uh, from which Tychicus came from. And so that makes sense, too, why we'll see that he was also used to help deliver the letter. Now here we see a little bit more detail about him. And how is he described? Tychicus was probably the individual who carried the letter both to the Colossians and to the Ephesians. That he physically took these letters that Paul had written and delivered them to the churches. Uh, in, in the case of Ephesians, it was probably Ephesus and a group of other churches in that area. That There were probably multiple copies that he had. In Colossians, there was one single copy that he took. Uh, at the same time, the book of the letter to Philemon was was written, but that was probably uh, with Onesimus, who that was a very much more personal letter that was taken. But look what it says about him. We see both in the reference at the end of Ephesians and the end of Colossians that Tychicus is described as a beloved brother and a faithful servant. He had been given the responsibility of carrying the actual letters, two of these most important letters in the New Testament. Imagine what would have happened if Tychicus was, you know, if he had just gone off someplace else or if he had, he had lost the letters. It's like, oh, I, you know, I knew I had them here someplace. You know, what would have happened? Apparently somebody, whoever was in charge of the letter to the Laodiceans may have done the same thing because we don't have that one. But, but he, was, he was a person that he was trustworthy he was faithful. He was described as a beloved brother. He was a man that had proven his commitment to the Lord, and he was being given big responsibilities. Not only was he carrying the letters, but he was also to report to them about the condition of Paul, and likewise, no doubt, they were, they, he was going to report back to Paul about the condition of the churches. That uh, generally, when, he, when Paul sent somebody out, to give them news about how he was doing and to send them a letter, he wanted to hear back about what was going on in, uh, about, with those churches because Paul was very, as we know, very, very concerned about the activity that was going on in the churches, that they were being true to the faith, that they were resisting the temptation to, to um, desert the faith when they were being persecuted. Paul always wanted to know what the condition of the churches were. And so Tychicus, while not one of the most well-known characters of the Bible is one that is always spoken of in, in very good terms. You can see that in, he was being sent to Ephesus, so he probably also may have carried the letter to, to uh, Timothy, uh, and then may or may not have been, he was, Paul was debating whether or not to send him to uh, Crete, which is where Titus was when he wrote this letter as well. He is someone that we can look to with admiration and with a desire to emulate. The fact is that the body of Christ has had these types of people throughout its history. They're always, you know, not the people that, that are, that get all of the attention, 
but there are these faithful servants, the ones that you can rely on, the ones that you can trust, the ones that are always there to carry the letter, to give the word, to do what has to be done. And these are the people that, that really have built the body of Christ. It's not the big, the big uh, preachers, while they've gotten a lot of attention. It's really the individuals who have always been there. It's the Tychicus of, of the different ages and different churches throughout time. Those that have, that have had responsibility really far beyond what the world would recognize. Now we like to look at people like Moses and Peter and Paul to get our inspiration as our role models. However, most of us are never going to be Peter's and Paul's and Moses. Most of us are going to be more like Tychicus. And I think it's valuable for us to look at these people who are just mentioned briefly in the scriptures and given these good, good statements about them and see them as a beloved brother, a sister, a faithful minister of Christ. How, what a blessing it would be to have that as your legacy. Is that when people speak of you, they don't think of you as Philetus. Remember what they thought about Philetus? He's a cancer. No, you'd rather be a Tychicus, a faithful and a beloved brother, a faithful minister of God. And I think we can look at, at, at individuals like him and we can see and get an inspiration and a desire to emulate them. Because really, most of us are going to be a Tychicus. We're not going to be a Moses. We're not going to be a Paul. But we can be a Tychicus. Or we can be a Philetus. So just always remember that. What is it that, that is going to be your legacy as people think about you and your relationship in how you've interacted with those in the body of Christ? So Paul then ends the letter with a typical benediction, wishing upon the readers peace and love with faith. So he leaves them with this sense of the goodness of God. He, he has this bookend, really. Talks about, uh, he, he opens the passage, he opens the, the letter with this. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God of our uh, Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He leaves us, or he starts off with this very positive, uh, encouraging statement. He grants us peace and grace, and then he ends in much the same way. Verse 23, peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he concludes in the very last verse, he ends by wishing grace upon the readers. This is exactly how he started the letter. Right after the introduction where he identifies who he was, the first thing he says in verse 2, grace to you. And then he ends it, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. It's fitting, it's a fitting way to both begin and to end this, this most clear and well-developed letter dedicated to explaining what the grace of God means to the Christian believer. From reading Ephesians, we learn that our relationship with God is entirely about God's grace from beginning to end. Therefore, he begins with grace, he ends with grace. There is nothing that we can do to deserve the favor of God, but he has made it available to us. We deserved punishment and condemnation for our selfish, sinful disobedience to God's will. But God reached down with a heart of mercy and offered eternal life apart from anything that we could do. And, there, and then blessed us with all the spiritual blessings, made us adopted children of God, sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise. All of these are acts of grace. And therefore he begins this letter by offering grace and he ends it by wishing grace upon all those who, are, who have a sincere faith in Jesus Christ. There is no way that we could earn what God is giving to us. The only possible way is for God to provide it freely, which he has done. Jesus Christ paid the price. We simply need to accept the gift. God made it available to all people through creating the body of Christ, the church, and through, through faith in the gospel of Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, made these blessings available to us. All of mankind has the opportunity to receive God's grace. 
And once we become members of the body of Christ, we are placed in fellowship with God. We have access to him through prayer. We become brothers and sisters with one another, all who share that same faith that we are sealed with security and certainty until the day of redemption. And I think we can look now, as we've completed now, looked at the full picture of the letter to the Ephesians, and we can just be full of, of joy and rejoicing for what God has done for us. We can't do it ourselves, and we aren't expected to do it ourselves. And God now is giving us a clear picture of what he has done as it was revealed in this letter. And I, I, I just would hope that we would be able to go home, take this uh, little these notes here and just reflect upon them. Look at the verses themselves as uh, in the summary and get a better picture of what it means to be truly and fully and completely under the grace of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this amazing letter that you gave to us that was revealed to us through your servant, the Apostle Paul. And I think of the many lessons that we receive from it. Most of all, the fact that there was nothing we could do, that we are saved by grace through faith plus nothing. For by grace are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one should boast. We can look at a man like Tychicus, and we can see an example of,